Hi everyone, thanks for listening. And we're here with Seth Dillinger. I'm really excited to have him. So amongst other things, he's a Feldenkrais practitioner as well as done work in circling and other movement and other meditation like practices. Personally, I first heard about him through John Tavaki where he did an episode integrating his work on the Feldenkrais method, which I think he'll explain in a minute with work on how we can use this movement practice and awareness practice and integrate that into the wisdom practices that cognitive scientist John Tavaki is creating. Uh, and so I personally started doing these practices and I actually met Seth by emailing him and wanting to ask a bit about this and about his work. And I also attended one of his sessions where he, he hosted a sort of movement practice session. So thank you very much, Seth. How are you and, and anything else you want to add to that, my introduction? Yeah, thank you so much for uh, this invitation. It's lovely to be talking with you today. Um, lovely introduction also. So, yeah, the question about what is the Feldenkrais method, as I think I said to you um, before we started recording, for me personally, it's a question about part of what I do, mm. not everything. And yet it's also a question about something that is the foundation of everything I do in terms of how I think and how I conceive of um, the various practices that I'm involved in. Um, and I think that, um, you know, how we met is really um, fortunate for setting up an interesting conversation because of the frame that you already mentioned. Um, you mentioned John Berveke and Anyone who knows him will associate him with the word wisdom. So something that I've come to saying about the Feldenkrais method, which is still a little bit um, opaque, but it, it starts a nice conversation, is to say that the Feldenkrais method, as you mentioned, it is a movement practice. But I like to say it's a, it's a, it's a wisdom practice disguised as a movement practice. In other words, come to a class advertised as being about the Feldenkrais method, you will move your body, <laughs> you will explore how you do that. And sort of on the surface, like if someone filmed it and there was no sound, you'd say, oh, these people are moving in different ways. And then they stop moving and then they move again. And then, you know, at the end of class, they get up and they leave. That's true. So it's in that sense, a movement practice. But what's happening internally is more important than what's happening that could be caught by a camera. So, <laughs> and your camera's catching your microphone moving around right now. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, so what happened for you internally just now while your camera was, were, were you going, oh, shoot, my microphone is. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I kind of like frozen. I was like, oh, my microphone's really positioned. Let me like start readjusting that. Um, right. So uh, my breathing probably slowed a bit um, and I got tense. So but this is kind of right. And I'm talking and, you know, what happened to your attention? I'm, this guy's talking to me, but damn it, my microphone, you know, like that's already actually what's happening in a Feldenkrais lesson. Although we don't generally practice with microphones during podcasts. <laughs> it's yeah. like um, so this so morning this I will go for it. Yeah. Well, well I was going to say this thing this what we're, the Feldenkrais method is because you can think about it all the time it's about awareness in your body and almost every movement so go for it okay so what you just said I think is one of the most crucial things that people never get about the method it's actually about what you're doing all the time you and I are on a podcast and talking and some people would be like well that's not much to do about movement they're just in chairs looking at screens and talking but your head is like bouncing up and down like so is mine, almost like seeing your head do that makes my head want to do it because there's some sort of rhythm that happens. And it like, oh, I feel more connected. Like you're bouncing around and I try to be totally still, like I feel real tense, right? So I'm like, oh, okay, that's better. But that internal dialogue I'm having right now and I'm articulating out loud, I didn't have that internal dialogue until I was doing the Feldenkrais method. Mm. The Feldenkrais method taught me to do that and what I would say, a, a phrase that I use, which is my own phrase, but I think it's another just like to try to be pithy about it. 
I would say that the Feldenkrais method is a somatic inquiry. And people are, are familiar with Socratic inquiry, maybe, which is like, I ask a question and I don't know the answer of it, but I ask it anyway and I see what comes to me or I, I ask you a question and see what comes to you and we, we engage in an inquiry. Well, in a Feldenkrais lesson, um, so, so here, another, another way of answering your question, I thought of this earlier, um, but seemed convenient. I woke up this morning, I thought, I'm doing a podcast with Jack and I'll be honest, I don't feel like in the best shape right now to get on a podcast. And I said, well, good thing that I have an hour and a half before. So I have time to do a Feldenkrais lesson, right? Mm -hmm. So I lay on the floor. And again, if you watched me with no sound, you would see something that looks like a curl up because I was lying on my back. I stood my feet up and then I was taking my head and my knee towards and away from each other. And my back would have to round like this, okay? I wasn't doing curl ups. I essentially did that movement for an hour in different ways. But at the very beginning, and I was listening to a, a colleague you know, of mine on a recording, so it would just be simple for me. I was letting him guide me. But essentially, I was taking my head and my knee towards each other many times. The first thing he had me do before I did that was to just lie there and he said, imagine the distance between your right shoulder and your right hip, right? And he gives me time. So I just feel that and my attention is framed in the way that he's suggested. And then he sort of says, well, are you listening to the back of your hip, the back of your shoulder or the front of your hip and the front of your shoulders? Oh, okay, there's a new distinction. So we try on both of those. Then we go over to the other side of the body, we do the same thing. Is it longer on the front on the left or is it longer on the front on the right? That's a, someone could say that's an objective question, but the answer is phenomenological. The answer is just in my body. And I mean, sometimes if I work with a client, they'll be on the table. So you can see over my shoulder, uh, a table, I can work and use touch with a client. Mm -hmm. I might ask the client to lie on the table. And as the practitioner, I might look at them and I'll say, which, which side of their torso is longer? I might say to that, I might say to myself rather, oh, I can clearly see, you know, this person is sort of like this and this side is longer and this side is shorter. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask them which side is longer and which side is shorter. They will tell me the opposite thing from what I see. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, some, some people can feel very clearly which side, I mean, a lot, mm -hmm. but, but this is, it's not, uh, like, again, if we took a, a photograph and then we all looked at the photograph, we could, we could talk about something that we claim is objective. But for ourselves, we don't have a visual image of ourselves from the outside. We have a visual imaginary image of ourselves from the outside. Mm -hmm. And what we often find is the way I imagine my body is a little different than how it is. So anyway, I was doing this movement. I was rounding you know, and, and then I mentioned those lines between my hip and my shoulder. And every time I do the movement, the colleague on the recording is asking me what happened to the length of that line? What happened to the length of the line along the back between the shoulder and the hip? What happened to the length of the line along the front? If you just, one thing for you, but for any listener, can you sort of see or even feel what I'm talking about? And you might think, sure. Or you might think, I wish this guy would demonstrate, you know, so I, you know, it'd be simpler, but that's what you're doing on the floor. You're translating words because the teacher's not demonstrating and, and you're trying to have an embodied experience. So I'll, 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 I'll stop the description in a moment because I know it's lengthy, but just one more mm -hmm. thing. I, I, I basically keep going for an hour, but in the course of it, he's asking me, well, how are you using a shoulder blade? Where is your sit bone going in space? What happens if you think of your sit bone doing this while you do the movement? What if you have to think of your sit bone doing that as you do the movement? Each one of these, I might have a minute to feel into. And at the end, I don't know exactly why, but I stand up and the whole image of my body and how it feels is completely different. And what I would say to you is my sense of who I am and how I move through the world has also changed in that sense. Like, so why did I not feel so great this morning about being on a podcast? I would say, cause I wasn't 
completely wise last evening with how I like managed my energy, what time I went to bed. I was like, let me do something a little wiser this morning so that I can, you know, talk to Jack and feel like <laughs> I'm not on some other planet. And it actually helped me do that. So even if I don't say something about how I feel physically better this morning, I'm much more prepared to do this podcast with you because of that process. Yeah, you, thank you. And you mentioned the crucial point about the Feldenkrais method, which is this, this distinction between the subjective body image of what we and where and how we feel our, our body is in space and how it can kind of, there can be a discrepancy between what is actually going on and what we think is going on. And I, I've you know, experienced this where you, you, or, you know, you, you talked about the, the specific Feldenkrais method that you were doing. And then many of the exercises, you will feel a kind of frustration of like, I actually don't know what is going on with my body. So maybe could you expand a bit on that? What is the body image and why do, why is there? And, uh, and why is it so important that there is this internal representation we have of where our body is in space and what impact does it mm -hmm. have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you think of a baby lying on its back, think of the movements it does with its legs, kind of kicks them like this, right? And you'll notice it kicks them together. That baby is not differentiating between my left leg and my right leg. Mm. They're obviously not verbalizing it either because but they are a being that has entered the world and is trying to figure out who am I? What is this world? How do they connect? How does it all work? And as I'm sure you know, we humans take longer than any other animal to figure out just locomoting. Like a lot of animals are born and within a minute, they are walking like a lot of four-legged animals, you know, a sheep, a deer, or something like that. They can just locomote through the world. So, so that we could say it's all wired in. When you and I were born, we didn't have a clue how to walk. We didn't have a clue how to roll over. You know, that takes months. And so fast forward to now, you and I are pretty good at walking around without falling over, right? How did we do that? Well, one of the one of the first steps was noticing that I have a left leg and a right leg, and that they could, you know. So that's the most simple level. And then if we go all the way to the thing I described, I was doing this morning. When I round my back like this, my shoulder blade could move up towards my ear, or it could slide down my back. And usually, I don't even notice which of the two it's doing. When I explore the feeling of it doing this and the feeling of it doing that in one of those um, ways of making the movement, I can breathe. The other one, it's harder to breathe. In one of those, I feel neck tension instantly. And the other one, I don't. I didn't know that before I lay on the floor and you know my colleague on the recording asked me to make that experiment. But if I do those experiments, often enough, it's more likely that the next time I just think, I want to round my back and take my head and my knee together. It's more likely that without thinking about it, I'll make the movement with my shoulder blade that supports my breathing, that supports me feeling like my body functions the way I want it to versus I'm fighting with myself. And so we could, like, let's say you're a philosopher and that's your thing in life, not movement. The fact is, if you're trying to think deep thoughts, <laughs> but you have tension in the side of your neck, that's noise. Mm -hmm. If you can get rid of that tension and then go think your deep thoughts, even if you don't think movement is a to do with wisdom, you might feel wiser because you're you're just thinking clearer about, I don't know, you read Heidegger or something and you want to say something intelligent about it. You know? So in that that's how I would connect. Yeah. 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 Go on. So, oh, that's good. I, I, I could just always be going, you have to stop me. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Like, it's funny because one thing that makes me think of is in in John Deveke's terminology, he talks a lot about the, the ways in which we are adaptive also make us maladaptive, right? So, and for example, behavioral economics, we have we can have uh, heuristics which help us make complex decisions, right? We you know we'll just do the thing which is comes available to our mind, but that also can be a bias. And similarly, then it makes me think that 
with our own body image and the way we as humans learn and why we need the body image is that we are perhaps so flexible and adaptable. So it's a good thing that we're constantly able to change our body image, but that that can then go wrong. Whereas maybe a, an animal has less flexibility, but they, you know, they don't have the trouble of like needing to like constantly figure out how to walk, you know, and navigate the world. Um, Cause th this makes me ask why, why, you know, you've done this practice for many years. Why can't someone almost complete the Feldenkrais Christ method? Why can't one like get the perfect body image and sort of never have to do it again? That's oh. sometimes the way I think about it. Why, why can't I just perfect it? And, and, you know, well, it's funny because Feldenkrais, he has a book and he has a movement lesson, which each of them have the title perfecting the self image, something like that. It's like perfection. What? But one of the things that he, he did, which I think I, I have encountered people who have a very negative reaction to this. I'll just say that. Um, but I think it is one of the most brilliant things that he did is he says, I have formed in my head an, an image of ideal movement. Now this, the, I mean, I think a natural negative reaction to that would be like, I don't want to be a perfectionist. Like I've already learned through my own hard knocks of life that like trying to be perfect messes me up. Right. And so you're telling me I could move perfectly. Like you're setting me up for, but what he would say is no, I work let's imagine he's doing that manual work. I work with someone with cerebral palsy. They're never going to have ideal movement. But then I have an image of my head of how a gold medal acrobat can move. Right. And what are all the ways that I can bring this person with cerebral palsy just that much closer to the movement of the gold medal Olympic athlete? Right. And so it doesn't, we never expect to, to reach the ideal, but to, the ideal is a direction. It's an orientation. Um, and, you know, we could also say, so, so, so like with the shoulder going up or down and one version supports my breathing and one doesn't, he would just say things like an ideal movement, the breath is free. Seems pretty non-controversial. Like it's not ideal if I can't breathe right now. It's just not ideal. But if I can even make the tiniest minute little tweaks and my breath gets 1% better, I can also say, aha, I moved in the direction of the ideal, not away. And that can be enough for me to say, good, and now I'll take a rest. And then I just rely on the wisdom of my nervous system, you know, to be in dialogue. So you mentioned John Verveke, and he likes to talk about opponent processing. And one of the examples he gives is the autonomic nervous system. And uh, so, or, or yeah, what, the what am I, I'm the like the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, the sympathetic I think. Sympathetic and the parasympathetic, two different states. One, you know, sort of colloquial called rest and digest. Mm -hmm. And the other one known as fight or flight. There's definitely situations where one of those is more ideal and the other, but you know, he talks about we shift from fight or flight into, you know, rest and digest back and forth. And if we're just animals in the wild, there's a moment we need to be ready to fight. We need to be able to run away. There's another moment where we need to be able to rest. And obviously we want to be safe. We want to be, you know, where predators can't find us. But then if we really have that sense, there's no predators here, I can go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And modern humans, kind of like me last night, we're in a safe place and we're staying awake because our thoughts are bouncing around. And that's the thing that he would also talk about in terms of the self image. My self image could have something to do with the distance between my hip and my shoulder. But another uh, version of the self image, one that I know very well is walking around all day and thinking, I'm a failure. I'm a failure. Mm -hmm. How does that feel in the body? Right? How does it feel? You were talking about doing push ups before we got on, how would it feel to do your push-ups? Just every push-up you think I'm a failure, <laughs> right? <laughs> every push-up you do, or of course, every push-up you do, you think I know how to do a push-up. This is pretty easy for me. I can do this. 
In fact, it's easy enough that I can get interested in little subtleties of how I do it, right? And so that, you know, right? Like, like, like uh, sometimes I ask students to like, lift your leg in the air and think about how heavy your leg is and how hard it is to do. Now <laughs> pick it up and think about how light it is and how easy it is. Yeah. It feels totally different. Why, you know? why, why, why do you feel that um, the, the, the mind and the, the body are so, so linked in this way that I, I mean, yeah, I guess in the Feldenkrais method, it's, it, it's kind of in the case, you know, Moshe Feldenkrais, you create it kind of argues, there is really no distinction, right? Can you maybe touch a bit more on that? Because I think it's very interesting. There's no distinction. Oh, between, between mind and body. Of, yeah, between yeah, between sort of the way we kind of feel, right. engage, and, and attempt sort of action, and like how we sort of how our movement actually occurs. Right, right. Well, um, I'm sure you're familiar with the idea that a lot of what is wrong with our world today, we could blame it on a guy named Descartes. Right, and Descartes, and and I'm I'm like not someone who's read a bunch of philosophy. I'm like repeating what I've heard, right? But here's the guy who said you have mind and you have matter, and they're just always separate, right? And so this whole thing that you know in the world of uh, that is broadly labeled mind dash body, like we're putting them back together again. There's something that we do where we, we yeah, we, we just say they're not so separate. And in, in a simple way of thinking about it is every time I do a push-up, of course it's about my muscles, but I would never be able to do the push-up if my brain didn't say, hey, muscles, it's time to do a push-up. Like the push-up starts in the brain. Mm -hmm. It starts with the image of a push-up. It starts with remembering how someone taught me how to do a push-up. You know, um, like John Verveke's terms about there is a propositional idea of a push-up. There is a procedural knowledge of how to do a push-up. There is the participatory experience of doing the push-up. And that's a place where the Feldenkrais method spends a lot of time. There's a perspectival version, which is like what I said before. I'm a failure as I do the push-up. That's a per perspective I could bring into my push-up, you know, and so... Feldenkrais would say, no matter what, you're always doing four things simultaneously. You are always thinking, you are always sensing, you are always feeling, and you are always doing, or we could say you're always moving. So, and just to be clear, sensing would be like the feeling, the sensory touch feeling. Um, the word feeling is more like my emotional, like if I think I'm worthless or, you know, some terrible thing I think about myself. Now, when I do the push-up, I might not be saying to myself that I'm a failure, but if that's my general attitude in life, that's like the backdrop. So, I mean, another person would be wonderful to bring the conversation. Um, you saw that I commented on the podcast you did with John Rusin. Um, I watched it last night because I've talked to John Rusin. I think he's wonderful. And he has this whole idea of musicality, which I have really, I, I teach a, a monthly workshop here in Washington, DC, outside in the park. I'm actually doing it tomorrow. It's called the musicality of being. And it's partly inspired by things I got from John Verveke, Guy Sengstock. Uh, the two of them had a conversation once online and the name that they put under the video was the musicality of being. So I kind of stole it, <laughs> but I told John and he didn't seem to get mad. But then John Rusin, um, he talks about the musicality of life, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like I'm doing this push-up, but simultaneous to this push-up, I'm in a long-term relationship with someone. Mm -hmm. And then we broke up. I remember he talked to you on your sh show about what happens when you break up with a person. Well, now the entire world is no longer organized around like this is the person maybe that I curl up with at night. That doesn't happen anymore. It just radically changes everything, including how I do my push-ups. So that's another version of the self-image. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, 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 because it makes me think that like, yeah, you're doing a push-up, but you're doing a push-up embedded in a life that, you know, you, you just ate breakfast or yeah, and you're going, you have work later or not. Yeah, it's, so it's- uh, Right, it's, um, right. It's, well, you know, I, I, um, I bring up, we talked about push-ups and me doing them before, 
and the and I, I guess you know before I would do them and I I would assume that working out is very painful so I would you know feel all kinds of pains in other places but I felt I thought well it's a good thing right um, and it's hard to distinguish between what's you know good and bad pain or what you should or should not be experiencing right so um, for me it's been really fun to experiment okay what what ways can I bring this sort of mindset into to trying out mm -hmm. and and and. And you know, into different domains. And I liked in this podcast of you you kind of initially brought it up as we're doing a podcast, right? And obviously we're gonna be thinking about it because I kind of wanted to ask how we apply the Fall and Christ method to areas beyond like the the practice, but inherently you've been talking about how it sort of um, applies everywhere. Um, yeah. Well Yeah. Well, well I can answer that specific question if you like. Um, I mean, it gives me an opportunity to talk about something uh, that I do. I have a 12-week program called Grounded Connection. And part of it is, is based on my training in the Feldenkrais Method, but I bring in other things. But one of the sort of things I've come up with, which is an example of me taking my training in the Feldenkrais Method and then asking myself this question, how do I apply it throughout the day? Um, I've come up with something that I call the presence mantra. And so in the 12 week program, the very first thing that everyone does is they learn the presence mantra. And as I'm sure you know, but just to sort of, you know, give the whole sense of it, a mantra is a phrase that we repeat over and over. And, you know, maybe some people do this if they want to make more money and they have some phrase about that, or it could be all kinds of things. The presence mantra is five words and the next thing I want to say is it's five words. So you'll remember five things. It's not about the words. It's not about chanting the words, nothing particularly special, although something would happen because you chant any five words and you could get interested in those five sounds. And what does my tongue do? What are the five shapes my tongue makes? And you could get really interested in that. But, but really what I want is for people to know that there are five relationships and there's more than five, but five is convenient. There's five relationships that I'm having to the world that are always happening, always. So like Feldenkrais said, you're always thinking, you're always sensing, feeling, and doing. I would say you're also always having a relationship with your breath at every single moment. Like we, we talked about this. Sometimes I'm, I can breathe easily, sometimes not so much. So in this moment, how's my breath? This is a simple question, but if I could ask myself that at the grocery store, if I could ask that while I'm driving my car, while I'm talking to my friend. I could ask that while I'm upset. I could ask that when I feel great because I just got a really nice nights of sleep or whatever. So et cetera, et cetera. But I'm always in relationship to the ground. You and I were both standing or sitting right now, but there's a space under us. There's the earth is basically under us. And if it wasn't there, we would fall. <laughs> it's, you know, and we're always attracted to the center of the earth center of the earth actually in tiny way is always attracted to us. So question is always like, am I sinking into the ground? Or am I actually sort of lifting up, making use of the leverage of the ground? Like when I walk, I push the ground behind me to go forward. Mm -hmm. But if I'm sinking into the ground, this has a particular emotional quality too. Like I'm talking to you, how does it feel even for you? If I'm like, kind of like uh, sinking here, right? Versus like I come to here, and I can also, there's other versions of this, right? I can, I can fate, I'm going to say, I need to have good posture and I could do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But all of that is the relationship to the ground, we could say. Just quickly, so I don't take forever. Sorry. We're always in relationship to surrounding space, the space of the room I'm in, for example. We're always in relationship to sound. I'm talking to you, I'm making sound, but my fan is blowing, it's making a sound. Mm -hmm. That's all in relationship, always. Um, we're always in relationship to light. One side of your face has more sunlight on it than the other right now. And when I say that, maybe you can feel it, right? Yeah. And in yeah. fact, maybe you set up for this podcast so you wouldn't be staring into the sun because you thought that wouldn't be the best way for me to, right? So there's a relationship to the light. Um, and and, and this, this all like, I was thinking about all this and then I read John Rusin's book about musicality and I was like, oh, you know, so there's five things. They're like five different instruments in an ensemble that's always playing, except I'm aware that I'm in an ensemble, 
or I'm the guy in the band who's just like tuning his instrument while everyone else is playing. And like, people are like, what are you doing? You know, like I'm connected or I'm not connected. John actually said to you, and I, there's an exact same thing I think about. Uh, he said, does the, does the sound in your environment feel like music or does it feel like noise? That's a really important question. And what you can begin to do is say, there's a construction crew outside my window and it's bothering me, but they're not gonna go away anytime soon. So what if I just imagined it was music and then the drill goes da, 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 and then there's silence. Mm -hmm. And then again, it goes da, 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 da. Well, there's a rhythm there. Drill, no drill. Drill, sound and silence are in alternation. Now there's other sounds too, but if I just think of drill versus the drill is silent, there's a rhythm there. At the same time, my heart is beating, my breath is going in and out. All of these rhythms are taking place in the same space. So I could pay attention to that. So anyway, that's part of yeah. my personal yeah. answer. So in my program, people learn that at the beginning. And then for 12 weeks, we, we, we explore every nuance imaginable inside of that framework. That's that's really cool. And yeah, I noticed that, for example, like meditating and there's some really annoying noise. And I'm like, if I'm if I feel like I'll you know, go away and I'm, I'm like sort of shielding myself from it, it feels completely different. Um, so, OK, um, and on, I guess on that note of like, you no, know, things can be annoying. Um, sometimes either doing the Feldenkrais Christ method or just thinking about now that I have a better sense of the fact that there is a body image and you can notice your body more. I sometimes get annoyed by the method of like, oh, why have I, why do I still get the same pain? I'm like, why can't I just fix this issue? What, what would you say to people who, you know, they try it out, but they just, they find, they find it at times really annoying. Is that, is that, is, 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 you get what I mean by annoying? Absolutely. hundred percent. This is the most common thing. This is why a lot of people don't stick with the Feldenkrais method. It's too annoying. Why? because it slows things down too much. And I want my shoulder to feel better in 30 minutes from now. Now, the fact is, if you go slow and you don't think about your shoulder must feel better, it's amazing how much better it can feel 30 minutes from now. But you have to drain out that perspective because it's limiting. So that's like, again, that's the perspectival, but that is the typical perspectival. If I go to any exercise class in the world where the teacher says something like 10 more, you can do it, keep going, push, make it hurt good, you know, and all of those things, they're training you in a mindset, right? And so if someone says to you, make the movement so small and so slow that the instant you feel the slightest discomfort, you stop, and then you go back and you rest and you wait until you feel totally like every activation you just made is completely released and then breathe and then choose the moment to do your next movement and do it as softly and as ple pleasurably as you can. And if you can't do that, any movement without any slight discomfort, only imagine the movement. And then can you imagine the movement even slower? Can you imagine the movement in richer detail? And it's like, what? But it's all about this internal experience. And it's not to say, I mean, this thing about sound that I mentioned, I didn't so much get that in my Feldenkrais training, which is not to say, Feldenkrais has an incredible essay called On the Primacy of Hearing, where he talks about when we're in the womb, we're already hearing. Mom's heartbeat is in my ears long before I can see. But then most of humans move through the world orienting with their eyes. And he, one of the things he says is you should turn off all the lights in your home and, and blindfold yourself and spend a half hour living that way and just find out how it changes everything. And he says, you'll be more like a samurai at the end. You'll be more like an animal who senses a predator behind it. You know, so anyways, he, he did talk about that, but that's an example of something. So, so I also have a musical background and I was involved in improvisational and experimental music uh, and experimental music composition and improvisation. Um, so that's another thing I'm drawing on. But, but that's the sort of the outside experience. And then there's the inside experience. And the Feldenkrais method for most people takes them to the inner experience. So just 
back to your thing about I, I feel irritated. That feeling of being irritated is generally like I want time to speed up. I want to get to the other side of this problem faster. And I'm not, I'm not willing to, I just want the end result. I'm, I, I'm not wanting to be with the process. But if you think about so many other practices, just meditation, you know, is about the process of my breathing rather. It's not like I'm trying to breathe faster or I'm trying to get in more breaths <laughs> during my meditation than usual. It's like, can I actually observe how I'm breathing? So another phrase that people use for Feldenkrais sometimes is this a moving meditation. I'm rounding my back. I'm taking my head and my knee towards each other, but I'm meditating on it rather than exercising with it. So then I can notice that my irritation is just part of the movement. Um, you know, or I can't. And I say, screw the Feldenkrais method and I go do something else. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's, it's almost like if you, you can say that. And I I felt like that, but then I'm like realizing you still, you're always doing it because you're always, as you say, you're always sensing and you're always feeling. And so yeah. uh, you can only really avoid right. it. And uh, but I still avoid it when I have to, I know I should do a lesson yeah. and I don't. Um, so but even that, you know, I should do a lesson. What happens in your body when you say that, right? And what's the quality of the lesson? And if people don't know why we're talking, I mean, in, you might, if you do weight training, you might go to a class in fact, Feldenkrais always used the idea of a lesson. We're going to do a lesson now because it's a learning experience. But in any case, if, if I should do a lesson, what kind of attention and relationship to myself am I having? It's kind of my inner critic telling me to do the lesson. Mm -hmm. And I am like, my inner critic is over my shoulder saying, you still haven't healed your shoulder. Even though you've been doing this for 10 minutes, what's wrong with you? <laughs> or what's wrong with the stupid method? Maybe it's no good. <laughs> Versus like, what if you go to do a lesson in the sense of a lesson, like, I'm really curious how my shoulder works. I'm just, I have no idea how it really works because I never really thought about it. What if I do little movements and see what I notice? Huh. Wow, the first thing I notice is I don't notice very much. When, when I started the Feldenkrais training check, I didn't know what a scapula was. They kept saying the word scapula. I was like, what do you... And then sometimes they'd say shoulder blade and sometimes they'd say scapula. And I started to realize, oh, that's the same thing. Right. And then I started to realize, oh, that's that pressure I feel in the upper backhand corner of the rectangle <laughs> of my back, right? I'm being kind of crude, but that's kind of how my self-image was then. Now I know it can slide over the back of my ribs and that the bottom of it and the top could maybe move in different directions. I know that my breath is different if it's close to my spine versus further away from my spine. You know, I know that yeah. if the distance of my left and right shoulder blade is dip, is from my spine is different, that's why the breath in one lung feels different than the other. And I, I couldn't explain to you exactly why that's the case. That would be getting into my head in a way that starts to not be useful, but I can do the experiment. I can just breathe with my shoulder blade closer, further out, and feel something. And there's a wordless learning process that's happening that is separate from my ability to articulate it to you. My nervous system shifts and I just get up and feel different because my nervous system learns something. Mm -hmm. You have a, you have a, a skeleton in the background. So have you studied like say biology or like sort of our musculature beyond the Feldenkrais method and like how does, if you have like, how does that info? Because you know, if I've done, when I do a lesson, sometimes you'll talk about like, I don't know, the bones of the toe or like the, you know, the scapula. And I'm like, I feel like, hey, I don't know what's going on here. And it's, yeah. so, yeah. I know tons more anatomy than I did before I started the method. I don't know as much anatomy as many Feldenkrais practitioners and many other movement people. But if I just think of myself as a lay person, you know, who then discovered, you know, let's just say I discovered my own interest in how my body works. There was a moment where I didn't know what was being referred to when someone said scapula. And then there was a moment when I did. It just means that the more I learn about something like anatomy, then when I go to a class, it might be a Feldenkrais class, might be a yoga class. Maybe the yoga teacher uses the word scapula. But if I always go to that class and I don't know what that means, that's a moment in class where I 
have to confront my relationship to my body in a way. And sometimes I feel bad about it. Or sometimes I just say, oh, I'll figure it out or it doesn't matter. But anyway, this is maybe a funny answer to your question. Um, I know things like my bone, my feet each have 26 bones in them, which I didn't used to know. There's a hell of a lot more information about the foot that someone with more expertise than I could give you. But just knowing that, I can imagine all of the bones in my foot. I can imagine all the spaces in between the bones. I can decide to imagine the space between my third and fourth metatarsals and just put my attention there. And then if I shift it to the space between my first and my second metatarsals, I can notice that now I'm breathing differently. And I could, I could just geek out forever if I, if I wanted to, and I could take an anatomy class and I could get so specific. And there are, there are Feldenkrais practitioners who've done that. And I have learned so much from them, but mainly I've learned because they asked me to do this and feel my breathing and then do that and feel my breathing, you know, and I know more than my clients do about anatomy. And some of my clients know more about anatomy than I do, you know, and then we have a different conversation. They ask me cool questions. You know? That's interesting. And you kind of talk there about how it kind of, yeah, you can know that your, your, your feet have so many bones or whatever, but that's still informing your almost subjective experience of it anyway, right? So it's still going to come back to, you can't, you know, you can't, there's, there's only so much anatomy you can learn. You kind of also need to kind of feel your body at some, uh, at right. some point. Because, um, yeah, because I mean, otherwise, you know, doctors would all be in perfect health, right? Um, and uh, and you, they'd have the perfect body. Yeah, right? exactly, right. exactly. So the prop, propositional image doesn't doesn't work um, yeah. alone. So, but I'd like to ask you, what what happens for you if I say to you, "Hey, Jack, your right foot has twenty six bones in it." Yeah, when you were saying that, I started feeling my my thinking about it because recently I've been thinking about my, the way my toes they kind of get the ground and like and the way like yeah, they support my my foot so. I don't know, it's kind of weird. Right. I don't know. It makes me feel like right. my foot is more complex. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you are you standing up right now? Because it looks yeah, to me like yeah. you are. Yeah. Can I can I invite you into a little experiment? Sure. Okay, so just just step slightly back from your microphone so you won't run into it. Just just a little bit. Just lean forward and back. Just lean forward and back and be comfortable with it. But pay attention to your right foot and your toes. Because you mentioned they sort of grip a little. Mm -hmm. You'll notice if you lean forward and then you just lean a little too far forward, that's probably when they grip, yeah, you feel right? Like because you're now you're, you didn't fall over, but technically like, or whatever, you're yeah. falling. Your toes are trying to catch you. Do you think your toe muscles are the most efficient place in your body to hold, you know, to, to prevent you from falling? So if you go forward and your toe muscles grip, how nice is your breathing right now? Would you like to breathe this way for the next hour? Yeah, it's making me think that when I use my two muscles too much, I, I notice it's when like my body's readjusting and it's like, hey, you, you, you kind of, you move into a right. weird position. So that's helpful right. thinking about that. So if you were to just for a few minutes, you could also lean back and lean back too far and you'll feel somewhere, is it in my belly or is it my back that starts to tense up? So is, is it the front area of my body where the breath no longer can reach or is it the back area? Mm. Now, I said before, somatic inquiry. It's kind of what we're doing. The inquiry is what happens when I lean forward and back. But there's so many questions I can ask. When do my toes grip? When do they relax? When can I breathe and when can I don't? And what I would propose to you is if you did this for five minutes, 10 minutes, and you, you, you tried not to get irritated, you tried to stay curious. Doesn't matter if you could write an essay afterwards about how it all works. I bet you that you would discover some new function in your foot. I bet you you would refresh your breath. And if you only paid attention to the right foot and not the left, and you did this for 10 minutes, I bet the entire right side of your body would feel entirely on the left side. And then if you were really curious, you could wait to do the other side and you could just lie on your back relaxing, but just meditating on the fact that one side of my body feels totally different than the other. And most likely I prefer the feeling on one side. So I might get irritation at the second side that doesn't feel right. But then I might know, well, I could stand up in another minute and lean forward and 
back and I can just pay attention to my left foot. So this isn't like an emergency. I just have to be patient, right? And all kinds of things are unfolding. And I would submit that in a funny kind of way, I would say we're getting wiser or potentially have the potential to get wiser that way. And it's a wordless wisdom that's being cultivated. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That's, um, well, one, one, one thing that I kind of want to ask as you sort of like it sort of helped me inquire into myself like right now is I'm, I'm wondering what if you found there are like common issues people have like with their with their body um i'm interested mm -hmm. in like yeah the most most common things or like just so i almost get a sense for you know is am i having an right. uncommon experience or what yeah yeah um so I have a series on my YouTube channel called Biological Fitness. And I think it's the first session where people are doing a movement that everyone who's spent time with movement recognizes. And a lot of people call it a pelvic tilt. So you're lying on your back and you're going like this with your pelvis. You move it towards your feet, you move it towards your head. Does this sound like a, a movement that you might've done in various places, right? Okay, so when you move your pelvis towards your, your feet, you're gonna arch your back. You, you'll feel that the space between my low back and the floor gets larger because my pelvis went down, it changes the shape of my spine, it creates this, this sense of a bigger curve, right? Some people will do that many times and then they'll say, now my low back hurts. And the image they might have of the movement, and I'm being a little crude, but they might think, I'm going to take my low back and I'm going to arch it and I'm going to arch it. And they say, I succeeded because the teacher asked me to take my pelvis towards my feet. And every time I arch my back, my pelvis goes toward my feet. Mm. Success. It's success in the sense of like when we went to the school and the teacher said, be quiet. And we didn't make a sound. We were being obedient and we were learning obedience. So I, I take that obedience with me into my movement class and I arch my back and I succeed in doing what the teacher asked. But then, so, and, and, and I, I, I'm feeling gratitude to a client, not a client, a, a colleague who taught this to me. Okay, this is not my original thing, but if you bring your attention to your pubic bone in the front at the very, you know, between your legs down under your belly button down there, and you think I'm reaching my pubic bone down and away from my head and back towards the floor. That's the image of the movement. In other words, I'm no longer thinking, let me arch my back. My back is still arching, but my attention is on the pubic bone going down and away from my head. Like just imagine I'm lying on my back and a lot of what we do in our body, we notice it in relation to where our eyes are. So it feels like my pelvis is farther away from me now, which is crazy because my pelvis is me. It's always zero <laughs> distance from me, but I feel like it's further when I take it away from my head, right? But if I think of it that way, the arch in my back is gonna be lower to the ground and I'm gonna be using the muscles in my groin more. The, the muscles at the top of my legs are gonna be pulling my pelvis down onto the top of my legs. I'm gonna be closing the hip joints in front and I'll still be arching my back, but my interest is in the groin. And the result is that I don't work so hard in the muscles of my low back. And now the work that needs to be distributed through my body, there's another principle of the Feldenkrais method that Feldenkrais talked over and over. He wouldn't say, relax your body. He'd say, distribute the effort more evenly. So my low back muscles are still working, but the muscles in my groin, some of those powerful muscles in my body, they are, they are taking the lead now and everything feels easier, everything feels easier. And when I stand up, it's more likely that the distance between my, just imagine down below the screen, my, my pubic bone and my forehead, that distance is, is probably longer and I'm probably more upright in an easy way, right? When we stand upright, we have to contract muscles in our back. But if we're standing upright like, like this all the time because we're just jamming in our low back, it's miserable to stand up. It's miserable to walk around. And pretty soon I feel like a failure right? because just moving through the world is so painful, you know? And so that's where it comes back to the, 
the like broader, um, you know, self image of like my concept of who I am in the world. Mm -hmm. Awesome. You know, I'll say one thing and then I've have some more questions actually kind of about your background and how you got into this, but yeah. like, it's, it's funny, you know, you mentioned me standing up and, um, it's only in, I think in standing up more, you know, I sometimes think, Oh, I think my legs got stronger. And in a way I would say yes, but I also realized like, your body naturally goes, oh, we're standing up now all day. Like, okay, thank you. Um, thanks to this. But now it's like, okay, we have to, we have to stand up, you know, properly. Um, we, and, and then you realize that it is kind of, or it can be easy. Um, I, I simply, I'm very interested in how, like, in a way, the more exercise people do, or if they, if they, if they're like, you know, go on like hikes and they do more and more, it doesn't become more difficult. Um, it really becomes easier. I don't know. That's just a comment. Um, so, so one thing I wanted to ask was, how did you kind of get into the, the method? Um, and you, I think I've heard you talk a bit about mm -hmm. the past, how you got into it. But, I, and also I'm interested, what was your experience of, like, sort of your body and life before you got into it and then after? Mm -hmm. So I keep using this phrase as a kind of a hypothetical example. It's not hypothetical, it's my history. I feel like a failure. So I just felt like a failure in life about 10, 12 years ago, right? There was, there was a divorce that was, was going to happen soon. There was um, my whole relationship to having an income related to an activity that I could wake up in the morning and enjoy and go to bed at night and feel good about. There was an almost total absence of a social network. It was all this stuff. There were some issues in my right shoulder, for example, because I had been a meat cutter in factories for nearly a decade, which is not how I grew up. I went into the factories as a result of, of a whole period of activism and being following a uh, communist ideology, which I won't talk about, but I will just say that I still notice to this day, even though that is not my ideology, I still notice the exaggerated disdain that people have for those experiments, which absolutely, I'm aware of all the bloodshed in the 20th century, right? Mm -hmm. However, there are things that, for example, I traveled to Cuba. And I, let's, let's not even say good or bad. Let's say how different was my experience of the world in Cuba versus the United States. Night and day, it opened up a totally different concept in my head about how people might relate to each other on a societal level. And we could just leave it at that, right? But that's, that's where I was for, and, and so part of that experience was like standing on street corners with books by Che Guevara, suggesting to people that they read them. And some people like, basically spitting on me and other people being like, thank you, including people from Latin America and, and we're all speaking Spanish while we're doing it. And then now I'm trying to, that, that period of my life ends. Now I'm a father and now I'm about to get divorced. I'm trying to reintegrate into something like the middle class, you know, childhood I had my musical career that never happened, but that's what I thought I was going to do when I was in college, but I've lost all my musical friends. So I'm, I'm spinning around in life. And I just got one idea that was the light at the end of the tunnel, which was maybe I can improve my health. So I started running. I'd heard of something called yoga, didn't know what it was. I figured I'd go to some classes, opened my eyes to a lot of things. I loved it. Um, I'd heard of something called Pilates. I went and tried that. I'd heard of something called the Alexander Technique. And I knew that a lot of musicians liked that. And I thought about getting back to music. I happened to find an Alexander Technique teacher who was also trained in the Feldenkrais method, which I'd never heard of. And that's how I discovered it. And then I did Feldenkrais. And the first time I, I followed a recorded lesson, I found a free audio lesson online. I just like felt all this creativity and aliveness wake up in me that had been like dormant for a decade. And it was just like, and that, and that's, that's a bodily feeling. But it's not about reducing neck pain. It's not. It, it's like I feel vital. I feel like myself, you know. So, and then you know, it wasn't long before like, 
oh, if I, if I could wake up every morning and do this, great. And so then, then I had a career path that was way harder than I thought to make it, you know, doing that. And I'm really grateful that years later, I heard John Verbeke and I discovered the art of circling so I could think about how I talk to other people and not feel awkward. That was a whole piece that I didn't originally get from the Feldenkrais method. But today those things are integrated for me, which is why I've kind of referenced what it's like for you and I to talk to each other many times in the course of also talking about <laughs> the distance between your shoulders and your hips. Those are all the same thing to me now. They're, they're just different ways of talking about the same thing. So that's kind of a little bit of my background, how it fits. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Like, um, and even that, like, that last comment of, you know, I'm still thinking about it as like, and again, the more and more, I guess one, the more and more lessons I've done, it's funny because like I start realizing like, oh wait, the hips are involved in all of these movements. And so I'm like, are they all kind of in a way the same? And even ones where they're using the arms on my open, that's coming from the, the center of the body. So it's very, it's, I'm very interested in that experience you said about how, you know, you kind of, it wasn't just, you felt good in your body when you know you start that first lesson, right? It's kind of mental. Um, or it would be interesting if you expanded on it. I, I, okay. I don't, sorry to interrupt, but I would say it, it was it was almost more bodily than it was mental. Okay. It was more bodily, but like, you know, we talked about being in a breakup before. Like I, 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 I've been through a breakup in, in my experience not too long ago, and I'm, I'm very happy to say that there was sort of a reversal of the breakup, right? But like when that happened to me, more than anything, it's just instantly in my body. And when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I feel is the breakup. Before I think about it, it's, it's deeply, deeply, deeply embodied. And so, and, and I mean, you asked before about body-mind. This is how I would say they really, there is no difference, except that they are convenient words to refer to. But it's like the second my thinking changes, the second my circumstances in life change and that changes my thinking, before I could even think a thought, because remember again, the baby who can't tell the difference between the left and right leg, it also doesn't verbalize the experience, but it's deeply in the experience. And it's deeply in the experience of having, you know, a dirty diaper and feeling hungry versus I just got fed and bathed and I feel wonderful. Those are deeply felt and only later did they learn to put words onto those feelings. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why I just kind of wanted to pause and emphasize, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, there's a mental aspect, but that comes afterwards when I'm trying to explain it to you, really. Yeah, I think that, that also helps me kind of find myself how I felt like just being able to like, oh, my, my, my neck can move in that position. I didn't even move in that position. That's kind of the way it feels. Um, it even feels in a way with doing the Feldenkrais method, like it's almost like I have muscles I haven't used before. Um, it might, yeah. it might kind of literally be the kind of the case or using them more than you, you've done before. Um, so I'm trying to think of, um, cause personally, I feel like I've, 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 I've asked sort of everything I kind of wanted to ask. Um, sure. other than That's like, great. I, so one thing is I would almost be interested if you have questions for me, but one final thing yeah. you talked yeah. about, well, one final thing is you talked about doing the circling with, you know, Guy Senstock and the yeah. way in which you, you're now sort of that, this, this relationship of this interpersonal ways, you're sort of um, talking to others and then the way the Feldenkrais method thinks. So I'm interested in that and in what other ways do you think the Feldenkrais method can sort of be applied to other areas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one thing is, I'm just noticing my desire to slow down a little bit. And so sure. <laughs> I'm also thinking about the answer to your question, but um, maybe we can all feel that together. Yeah. But I'd like to bring something in that, that I think will, will, will answer your question a bit. And also I just want to kind of share another piece that, cause it mm -hmm. ties back to the beginning. But I said, um, I said that I think the Feldenkrais method is a wisdom practice disguised as a movement practice. So with, with Guy Sengstock learning circling, he calls that often something like a relational yoga. And he says like, 
how I listen to you when you speak, for example. We could think of that as an asana. Or even if I want to tell you I really appreciate you, like, Jack, I really appreciate, um, you know, your dedication to wisdom and the fact that you would set up these conversations with a person like me or John Rusin or um, Ren Anderson. And, you know, I notice that there's less views on your YouTube channel than on some of the other channels where these guys speak, but it doesn't seem like that's the point for you. And I just, I really appreciate that about you, right? Mm -hmm. And that does something to our relationship, but it's also like, I could have done that or I could have done that poorly, just like I could do an asana well, or I could do it poorly. Mm -hmm. So Guy Sangstock sort of says to people, let's, let's, for today's class, let's say, let's, let's practice the art of giving appreciation and we'll, right? But my sense of connection to you in this moment, since you're part of my world, it will change my ability to like do a Feldenkrais kind of thing, like have good posture. <laughs> if I don't feel so connected to you, I feel like some weird thing, that's gonna affect my breathing. So that for me is how I connect those two things. Um, and then the extra thing I said I'd like to bring in is, this is sort of a, a fast forward. Um, and I, I realize we're gonna be at the end of our time too. But um, in a couple of weeks, I'll be going to Bercherac in France. I hope I sort of pronounced that right. But um, there's a group called the Respond Network, which works very closely with uh, John Verveke, the Verveke Foundation. And um, this is a series of, uh, or a series, uh, a group of practitioners from around the world to do various things, right? But they're coming together for a meeting, uh, for a retreat under the, the umbrella of wisdom practice. And how do we, how do we, you know, how do we improve our ability to practice wisdom? And I, you know, they had a meeting last year in Vermont, which I wasn't able to participate in. They're gonna be there for a whole month. I'm only gonna be there for one week of the thing coming up. But what they have done, and this is, you know, John Verveke, had huge input into this, but I think people like Bonita Roy, um, Rafe Kelly, Steve March, if any of these, and there's many others that I'm not mentioning. I think Ian McGilchrist is gonna be uh, at this thing in Bergerac, again, probably not when I'm there, because it would be fun to meet him, but, um, and so anyway, the Respond Network that created this meeting I've been to an online workshop they led already. And one of the things that they've proposed to a person like me who, let's say I started my career thinking movement practice, and now I'm trying to transition into wisdom practice, even though I'm still in many ways doing things I was always doing. So their proposal is if you want to practice wisdom, you need what John Verveke calls an ecology of practices. So it's just like my experience. I, I got a lot from the Feldenkrais method, but at a certain point it's like, mm, be nice to try this circling also. It'd be nice to meditate. It'd be nice to do, you know, go for a walk in the park and see what I learned from that. Like, right, there's an ecology of practice. I'm not relying on one thing. The Respond Network's proposal is what would be really useful is that there's four categories of practice that you have. One of them is dialogical. So circling fits in that. I could make the case that Feldenkrais fits into that too. I'm dialoguing with my body. Maybe that's clear enough from what we've already said here. Mm -hmm. But another strand of the practice is imaginal practice. So Feldenkrais thinks about this all the time. But like I said to you a minute ago, lean forward and back. I could have also said, imagine leaning forward and back. Mm -hmm. That's deeply embedded into the Feldenkrais approach to movement. We often work in the imagination. So I thought, oh, I'm already kind of doing that just because of Feldenkrais. Uh, then the, the remaining two strands, so you have dialogical, imaginal, and then you have mindful, and you have embodied. Mm -hmm. So if we want to practice wisdom, just according to the proposal of the Respond Network, we're going to make sure to do our best to include the dialogical, the imaginal, the um, mindful, and the embodied. I would say that Feldenkrais has all of that in there, but of course the way I learned it emphasized movement a lot, which we could say the embodied piece felt really big out of those four. And so now I'm like, oh, how could I make sure that in every moment I'm including all of those things? Oh, thank God I did circling because that really helps me understand the dialogue piece, but I can still 
you know, I'm in dialogue or like you said, I'm doing a push up or I'm doing a Feldenkrais lesson, I'm irritated. Well, maybe I'm in dialogue with my inner critic while I'm, you know, doing quote unquote movement practice. So it's still movement practice, but now it's a dialogical movement practice. You know, so so anyway, we, we, we could go through all the different things, but um, that's kind of yeah, yeah. the connection piece that that I'm getting really interested in. And the exciting thing is there's a group of people proposing that, so I'm not the only one. Um, so there's a framework, you know, if some other practitioner of some other modality watches this, hey, go go to the Google search and put in Respond Network and find their website and read about it yeah, and stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, it's, um, it's cool that you bring up like the dialogical aspect and and the way you know you can any anything you say can kind of become okay well how how am i feeling as i say it and that's related to someone's reaction and in meeting in for myself you know it's it's i'm meeting lots of people at university but sometimes it's really difficult right and i'm it, that's why the following Christ method has been very helpful um because it's it's part of you get that embodied okay well how am i reacting you know Am I, you know, mm -hmm. am I short of breath as I start talking to someone? Uh, how am I, how am I sitting? How am I moving? So, and, and another thing I'll say is I'm, I'm really excited almost that you kind of uh, are getting involved in that sort of um, association mm -hmm. um, because I, I feel like the Feldenkrais method can really help bring the embodied into the other aspects too. Like you talk about, yeah. like, like, for example, you know, if someone just does circling, I would say maybe they would actually benefit from also the Feldenkrais method. Um, and then like vice versa for all, for the other ones. Well, that's really, that's really cool. So that's a kind of a nice also place to end. Um, so yeah, sure. Do you have any last words and where people can find you? Absolutely. Um, what I'll do is I'll just grab a couple more ideas from the respond network and I'll just put them out there, even though they could be other whole conversations. I'd, I'd love to, you know, just give you some names. You should speak sure. to some of the other people. I'll yeah, yeah. Actually, but, we, we, ideas yeah. of wisdom. Oh, sorry to talk over you, uh, no. just for a moment. Uh, uh, so, so another way of thinking of what we're doing in a wisdom practice, according to this framework, and I would say we're doing it in Feldenkrais. And I would say also that <laughs> when I get to the part about what I do, and if you want to connect with me, this is part of how I offer. But I'm borrowing the respond framework. We're we're trying to harmonize three things our view, like how, how we're seeing our perspective, care, what's important to me, but that also what I, what's important to me, that's where my attention goes, right? So you could think of like, I care about, you know, my family members, but that's also a description of how you use your attention. Mm -hmm. And then the final mm -hmm. thing is action. Like I don't just sit and think about how I care about my family members. I take actions that reflect that care that reflect the fact that that's where my attention is. So view, care, and action. And then how do we deepen wisdom? Again, I'm borrowing from Respond. Um, the the key, key people there are Nathan Vanderpool and, and Taylor Barrett, but there are many others. Um, to deepen wisdom, I tune into my sense of well-being in relationship. So the tuning in is like what we do when we slow down and we notice things that we don't normally notice. Well-being is my sense of, for example, oh, when I do this, I can breathe. That's more well-being than the other thing where I can't breathe. And then in relationship, like again, in this context, when I'm with Jack, right? That's, that's the context for it, right? Crucial, because if it's, I mean, in my experience, the, the context used to be when I lie on the floor and listen to a Feldenkrais recording. And then when I would go to meet with Jack, I would lose everything that I learned, you know, because I'd feel awkward, you know. So in any case, Grounded Connection, I mentioned that's my 12-week program. And if you're listening and you resonate with the idea that you're a creator of some kind, you have creative ideas that you'd like to bring to life in the world, and there are internal obstacles that keep you from doing that. Maybe it's internal bodily pain. Maybe it's, you know, the voice in my head. Um, if you'd like to be more connected to other people so that you can realize those ideas in the world through collaboration, um, that's who the program's for. Um, and so I have a website, sethdellinger.com. I'd love to also just give you a link if someone wants to talk to me directly and learn, you know, if ground connection sounds like something anyone hearing this is interested, they can, they can do that. Um, I would also just say, uh, 
I'm on Facebook. And uh, <laughs> a lot of people hate Facebook. I used to hate Facebook. At this point, I put a, something up every single day and I try to start a conversation the kinds of things we're talking about. So it's a place I love to dialogue with people that's made social media less of a obnoxious place for me because I try to start conversations and I, it's wonderful when people respond. So if you want to just put my name in the search on, on Facebook, you can also find me. And yeah, awesome. yeah, and thank you so much, Jack. This has been so wonderful. No, thank you very much too. I, I don't know, and I hope people enjoy it. I think they will. So yeah, awesome. I'll put all these links and things and you can give me them, but like against your website yeah. and things. I'll put them in the description. People can, can go to it. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Thank you so much. Take care, Jack. Uh, thank you. Also